Okay, this lecture <clears throat> I want to um, consider how debates at the heart of statistics, you might say the philosophy of statistics, in other words, considering what it is that statistics is trying to do, can have um, very practical implications for the psychologist and indeed any, any user of statistics. So what you've been taught, something I've labelled orthodox, orthodoxy here, uh, could also be called significance testing. So what I mean by orthodoxy is any procedure that you've been taught in which you look for a p-value and you see whether p is less than 0 0.05 and thereby declare a result as significant or non-significant. In other words, I take it that's pretty much all the stats you've been taught. And you may, may have been you may have thought about this as something like a cookbook procedure that's uh, been settled that, you know, this is just a bit of maths and this is how you do things and this is how you find your answers. And indeed the papers you read um, until very recently would have given that impression as well. They just non-problematically use significance testing and draw conclusions from it. And that's what your sort of... Um, indoctrinated is perhaps a bit too rude, but um, socialised anyway into thinking a certain way in every paper you read, every presentation that you go to. Now from the very beginning of the formal development of statistics around the 1930s, there were several schools of thought. And a, a certain way won the day for certain practical or, or other reasons, largely practical. Um, but the Bayesian way of thinking about things is now making a comeback. And you'll be increasingly exposed to Bayesian statistics in which significance and p less than 0 0.05 plays no part. So if you're interested in research, uh, the material I'm going through today will be something you probably don't see a lot of now, but you will see a lot of in the future. And what I want to present you with <coughs> is while there's a lot of issues involved, there's, there's one key issue that I think is problematic in probably every paper you read and every research talk you go to, because it isn't solved at all well by significance testing, whereas the Bayesian way of doing things uh, has a fairly straightforward solution. And that's the problem is of how do you get evidence that there's nothing? that there's no effect. How do you evidence that nothing exists? So let me run through, first of all, leading up to um, what significance testing does, then sort of illustrating the problem and then turning to how we would look at that problem from a Bayesian perspective. The, the essential way that um, significance testing works <coughs> for people who use it, uh, despite what the, um, the originators of the approach want, for people who use it to claim nothing exists, is they're saying, I looked for something and I didn't find it. Now, certain <coughs> creatures in the Himalayas are endangered, and the snow leopard is one of them. It's still there. But let's just take a time in the future where it's doubtful whether there's a snow leopard left in the Himalayas. So I say to you, uh, well, there's a picture of the Himalayas. And I said, well, I had a quick scout around, quick look here and there, and I didn't see a snow leopard. Is that evidence that the snow leopard isn't there anymore? Well, I sort of phrase that in a way. I hope you're thinking, well, not really, just based on that, just because you had a quick poke around. Uh, it doesn't mean there's no snow leopard. So the intuition I want you to have is just because you looked for something and it wasn't there, that in itself doesn't mean there's evidence that there's nothing there. Okay. Because that is going to be the problem with significance testing when applied to this question of, of whether there is an effect or not. So let's go back to Popper. And you can say falsifying a theory is based on um, the following little bit of logic. Based on the theory, X is impossible, but X happened. Therefore, the theory is false. So I hope that sounds quite straightforward. If a theory predicts the, the, 
something is impossible, but it happens, the theory must be wrong. We falsify the theory. Now, theories in psychology aren't quite like that. They rarely say something is impossible because they deal with probabilities just because people are noisy and all sorts of stuff happens. Uh, there's a lot of error there. And even putting error or um, um, the inaccuracies in your measurement aside, people just vary. So it's, I mean, even if um, extroverts um, tend to be um, uh, better at things in the evening and introverts in the morning, by and large, there's going to be exceptions, just because that's the way things are with human beings. So what about this? Why don't we change the Popperian schema just a little bit, and we'll do it like this. Based on, um, based on the theory that something is very unlikely, X is very unlikely, but X happened, then we have evidence against the theory. So we just change it to be probabilistic. Now, does that really work? Um, face value, there seems to be something to it, right? Uh, it just seems to be a, a generalization of something being impossible to saying, well, it's very, very unlikely, or it's very unlikely. The other thing I've substituted in here is the theory I've called it H0, because that's a symbol for the null hypothesis, because this is what you do in significance testing. The, the theory you set up to refute or nullify is the null hypothesis. Based on H0, X is very unlikely. X happened, there's evidence against H0. Now, I hope if I just say it like that, that sounds um, sort of intuitively plausible or you know, easy to understand. Because if I spell out what H0 says, we get a double negative here. So just, uh, just keep in your mind this one. So now I'm going to spell out H0. The null hypothesis is normally the claim that there is no effect. You see, it's a negative claim. So I'm just going to put that in here now. And it sounds a bit more of a mouthful. Based on the theory that there is no effect, X is very unlikely. But X happened. Therefore, there is evidence against the theory. There's, there's evidence against the theory on this schema that there is no effect. So, um, therefore, we have evidence there is an effect. You see the double negative. So this, if I just presented you with this slide, I think you would say, well, hang on a minute. Um, but if you just uh, hang, put in your mind that this is all we're doing, but I'm putting in what H0 claims. So that's what you get from a significant result using significance testing, um, according to one of the originators of significance testing. You're getting evidence that something exists if you get a significant result. Is that making sense so far? Good. Okay, but now uh, this is getting significant, uh, significant result, X happened. In other words, um, P was less than 0 0.05. Okay. To get a difference that big, P less than 0 0.05. It was unlikely you would get an effect that big or bigger, but it happened. But let's say X did not happen. Let's say, let's say the difference was... Um, um, not one of these extreme differences according to H0. Let's say the difference was pretty close to zero, for example, or small anyway. Based on H0, X is very unlikely, but X did not happen. Now, does that mean we have evidence for H0? Do we have evidence for nothing existing? <coughs> this is how people take the non-significant result in practically every paper you read and every talk you go to. They say um, the effect of the intervention was non-significant, therefore it didn't work. It didn't change depression. The effect of the intervention, intervention did not interact with gender, meaning it was non-significant. So therefore, it doesn't matter what gender or sex you are uh, in terms of this intervention. That's, I think, every paper you read. It was non-significant, so there's no effect. Bear in mind, though, this was like saying, 
we looked for something, a big enough difference. And we didn't find that. Now, the case of the snow leopard, I think you thought, yeah, just looking for it, not finding it. Well, whoopee-doo. How hard did you really look? But this doesn't tell us how hard did we really look. Just said you looked. Didn't get that result. So is this really evidence for there for the being no effect? Is this evidence for the null hypothesis? So this is the guy, uh, Ronald Fisher, who uh, put forward, uh, invented the term significance and put forward the logic of significance testing as we, as we typically use it. And he did agree with this uh, first little schema that a significant result, he said, is evidence um, against the theory, against, in other words, the null hypothesis. A significant result is evidence against Hypothesis. So it's evidence that something exists. Now the Bayesian, in fact, thinks there's limits to this conclusion. But I don't want to dwell on that, um, because by and large, I found in my own practice, doing Bayesian methods and significance testing, um, under the, the, the typical conditions, um, for which I and many others run experiments, the Bayesian and the significance test to agree in these cases often. So I don't want to dwell on this. I want to take the other schema. Now, Fisher himself, remember the originator of significance testing, said this one is wrong. Doesn't mean you have <coughs> evidence for H0. What he said instead was if you get a non-significant result, suspend judgment. <coughs> he wavered a little bit on that, admittedly. But he did, he did say um, that you should suspend judgment. A non-significant result means suspend judgment. And that goes back to the intuition that I tried to give you with the snow leopard. Just because you looked and didn't find it doesn't mean it's not there. Suspend judgment. So let me run through these same points with a, with a coin. So I, I have here a um, 10p coin. Maybe it's biased towards heads. Um, or um, maybe this is indeed a fair coin. So if I toss it six times um, and I get six heads in each of those six times, we can do a significance, significance test on that. And the probability of an event this extreme, assuming it's possibly biased towards heads or it's fair, <laughs> Um, gives you a p-value of 0 0.016. So that's less than 0 0.05. So by significance testing, um, you say reject the hypothesis that it's fair. Indeed, if, if we were going to have a gamble with this, and you said, but hang on a minute, um, let me just check the coin first, and, you got, and so he had an impartial person uh, flip it six times and got six heads, you might be beginning to think, there's something odd going on here. Don't rush into this gamble, um, right? Six out of six might be might be beginning to um, to unnerve you. On the other hand, if I toss it six times and I get four heads, that's not terribly unexpected on a fair coin. P-value 0.32. So you wouldn't reject the hypothesis of a fair coin. Or you could say um, there's not really much evidence against it being a fair coin. So maybe you'd be happy to go ahead with the gamble with me. Now, um, let's say, though, I flip the coin twice. I just want to show you this. That, that's, um, that's what we sort of tangles this like. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's what hairs looks like. <coughs> So I got two hands um, out of two tosses. Would you reject the hypothesis that this is a fair coin? Would you say, ah, uh, uh, not, not gambling with you, Zoltan. Well, the p-value is small. I, I mean, not, not small. I mean, 
you take a coin and you get two heads. It's, that's not terribly unlikely. So it's non-significant. That's non-significant. Does that mean we have evidence for this being a fair coin? Can we stop here and say, we have evidence for this being a fair coin, it is not biased towards heads. It's non-significant. So on the normal significant, non-significant that you come across in your lectures, it's non-significant. We accept it's a fair coin. And um, let's go ahead and gamble. Hang on a minute, you say. You've got heads twice. You've got heads 100% of the time. If it was biased, it would do that as well. Right? In fact, I want to show you this. Uh, so it's a double-headed coin. So I knew I was going to get two heads. I don't know if you're wondering how that, that we said you'd neatly into the next slide there with, a, with a two heads. To be honest, you look like you didn't really flip it. So. <laughs> okay, you just thought I, I, I had uh, skills in flipping coins. Yeah. I thought you were being weird. Yeah. Um, so clearly a non-significant result can't be evidence for this being a fair coin in itself, right? Because a biased coin, and this is maximally biased, it's not just 55% heads or whatever, this is 100% heads, it will produce the same outcome. So how can a non-significant result mean you have evidence there's nothing there? It can't in general, right? A non-significant result cannot in general mean there's no effect. There's no correlation. So. And, and that's because the number of trials is too low to tell anything. It was only two trials. So you, you could say in an experiment, uh, how do you know you had enough subjects? How do you kn know there was enough trials per subject? How do you know you had enough data, enough sensitivity? That's the question you need to answer. So a non-significant result could be because there is evidence for there being a fair coin. I mean, it can mean that, if we had a method for getting at that, or because there's not enough data to say anything at all. And if I just tell you it's non-significant, you don't know which one of those it is. Even if I tell, tell you I ran the number of subjects that's typical in this literature, you still don't know, because you don't know if the typical number of subjects in the literature is good enough. Because the reason why they run that number of subjects in the literature is just tradition. Was it done for any good reason? Did they work out how much subjects they need? How many subjects they needed? And that is essentially why Fisher said, if you get a non-significant result, suspend judgment. So what we would like to do as scientists and users of statistics, which is just people who want to collect some data and say, what does it tell us? After collecting the data, we'd like to know which of three states of affairs hold. Was there good enough evidence for there being an effect? Was there good enough evidence for there being no effect? Or was there no evidence at all to speak of? So significance testing makes a two-way distinction. A significant result, in, in some way, uh, is evidence for some sort of an effect. So it distinguishes evidence for an effect from the other two states of affairs. Again, the Bayesian actually disputes the, even the extent to which this is quite true, but in many cases this pans out okay, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But a non-significant result doesn't distinguish between evidence for no effect and no evidence to speak of. You don't know which one of those it is. It doesn't matter how non-significant it is. You do not know which one of those states of affairs it is. <coughs> so let me consider some possible solutions. First of all, within the orthodox tradition, I mean, it's not as if the, if the uh, sort of people who do significance testing weren't aware of this issue and didn't think about it. 
One way of dealing with that is not just to say significant, non-significant, this sort of uh, binary judgment, is to say, well, we got this sort of effect. Uh, this is what we got. And the population effect is probably around the sort of effect that we got. It could be a little bit less than it, and it could be a little bit more than the effect we got. And you may have come across a confidence interval. Have, do you know what a confidence interval is? Have you been taught about that? Just put your hands up if, if I say confidence interval. You say, oh yeah, we covered that. Okay. Slightly tentative raising of the hands, but nonetheless, most of you have at least come across the, the notion of a confidence interval, which is actually a fairly useful notion, but it's something like a confidence, confidence interval. The confidence interval is saying um, the, the population effect, which is the thing we're really interested in, is the population effect. Not just what happened in our sample, right, but what happens in general. Uh, it's going to be, um, given our data, we can rule out certain effects as being too extreme. But there are some effects we can't rule out. And that range of effects we can't rule out are the possible population effects. So one way of thinking about what your data tell you is the effect could be from this small to this big. And it's somewhere in that range. Okay. So you're not just saying yes or no but you're saying it's somewhere from here to here. Okay, that's a confidence interval. So it's a more nuanced way of thinking about it um, than just significant, non-significant. Then, then given you can say, well, this is the range of effects our data say we're allowed to say, as it were, the population effect could be. Is that range contained within a sufficiently um, small interval that even the biggest value is so small, we couldn't possibly be interested in it. Then we can say there's no effect that's um, worth being interested in. So it's the possible range smaller than the minimally interesting effect size. So a lot of advocates for this position, people recognised um, the problems with significance testing. Uh, indeed, major statisticians have got together in, in the last year and say to say significance testing, if what you're doing is saying significant, non-significant, and that's really all you take from it, that's really bad news, that is corrupting research. And part of the problem, uh, uh, part of the reason why we have reproducibility crisis and um, these problems with the research findings at the moment. So let's see how that spells out. So I, I, I um, I found this article um, that dealt with a phenomenon that um, I'd sort of been believed or told about, about. I didn't know this little aphorism before, but it um, spelt out a belief that I had. Beer before wine and you'll feel fine. Wine before beer and you'll feel queer. So what I, what I thought the case was when you're drinking is you, you, you start from the low alcoholic percentage beverage and you work up to the stronger one if you're going to have... A, a, a number of different um, drinks in the evening. But what you mustn't do is go from the strong one to the weak one, otherwise you get a bad hangover. I don't know, if you, have you guys come across that? And yeah, that sort of, that belief goes around, but has it been tested? And it turned out um, in uh, this year, people thought, we better test this. So they had a um, alcohol hangover scale, they got people to drink some beer and then some wine, or some wine and then some beer, and then they rated how hungover they were. And you can see they gave people, um, on the alcoholic, uh, alcohol hangover scale, zero means you have no hangover, and 56 means maximal hangover intensity. So you could, if, you want to, if you really want to evaluate this, you should look at the paper and see how the, the scale points were defined, but let's just go by this for now. And you can see that... Um, on average here, we're getting about 15. So there was some hangover. They gave people enough to drink that there's enough hangover, but you weren't completely wiped out. So that's good. I mean, I think that was um, you know, a reasonable level of hangover to induce ethically in people for the sake of um, finding out if, um, if this the aphorism is true. So this is uh, this is got a box plot. That's the uh, median value there, and this is sort of the 
the range of the middle 50% of points from there to there. Now you can see these uh, median or middle values are pretty close to each other. In fact, the mean difference was 0.34 on this hangover scale, uh, and it was non-significant. So this is what the paper reports. So it's non-significant, therefore it doesn't matter, don't worry about it. Um, you know, if, if the wine's there now and you're going to drink beer later, that's fine, just, just go with it. But they concluded this just on the basis of non-significance. Let's say you put a confidence interval on that 0.34. That goes from minus 0.3 to about one unit on the hangover scale. What that means is we're allowed, as it were, using sort of orthodox statistics to say, well, we don't know what the, the true difference is for the population they, they sampled from, but it's somewhere between about a half a drink, a half a point in the wrong direction to about a point in the right direction. Now, looking at the scale, I think, well, they're saying whatever the effect is, is less than one point on this 0 to 56 hangover scale, where people were getting hung over to the tune of 15 units. Now, I think that that's a pretty small difference, one unit on the hangover scale. So I'm prepared to say whatever the minimal interesting value is, it's probably a bit bigger than that. Um, and so I'm willing to say this rules out any interesting effects. I, I slightly um, sort of glossed over the issue of how you find out what a minimal interesting effect is, but maybe I can just say from my personal perspective, um, if the minimal interesting effect is um, one unit or something, I don't, th I don't think it's going to be smaller than that on this 56-point scale. I'm perfectly happy to have beer and wine in any order I please. Does that make sense? So one way of dealing with the issue of whether an effect exists or not is to say um, we need to define uh, how, how big an effect would be just worthwhile considering as meaningful. And if that sort of an effect is ruled out, then while we haven't strictly shown that there's no effect, whatever the effect is, it's so small that we needn't be bothered with it. That's the logic of this way of approaching things. And this is indeed open to you, whether you're Bayesian or non-Bayesian, something like this line of uh, reasoning. But you'll notice, I'm not sure you've ever come across a paper where anybody actually used this. Th this line of reasoning has been suggested in both the Bayesian and the non-Bayesian um, statistical literature for decades. Um, and it, has, it does have a certain logic to it. I can see how this could be useful. Right. But what if it's hard to say what a minimal interesting effect is? Because your conclusions depend crucially on saying what's so small is not to be interesting. As I said, I glossed that a little bit in this case. Um, I didn't tell you how to have a good reason for saying what the, what the minimal interesting effect is on this, this hangover scale. I just thought it seemed to me that one unit is not worth me bothering about and maybe you share that intuition. And I think in this case that's sort of good enough because in a way the point of this research is just to practically inform us the end user, we're the end user of this research, well, anybody who's a drinker and might have beer and wine in, in some order. And as long as we're happy with the minimal interest in effect size, then it's job done. But research isn't generally like that. And it's generally difficult to say what a minimal interest in effect is. There can be cases where it doesn't matter, so this logic can still be useful for you even if it's not a general solution to the problem. So statins are drugs that are given to people uh, to control, um, is it cholesterol in the blood or something like that, anyway, yeah. Um, and they've, they've, there's, there's been some research about how they might have certain side effects that aren't so great. So you shouldn't take them just willy-nilly. But there was also some research that said actually they could decrease the incidence of a certain sort of cancer called a glioma. So this study looked at, looked at this claim, effectively sort of a replication study. 
Now, the measure they had here, um, one means no effect, sort of a ratio of the probability of getting the effect if you take the statin, and the probability of getting the effect if you don't have the statin. That's some strictly called an odds ratio. Well, one is the null hypothesis value for this. One means um, there's no difference in the um, probability of getting the cancer if you take the statin versus getting it if you don't. So they said uh, the result was non-significant. Um, and um, our findings do not support previous evidence concerning this claim of the relationship between taking statins and glyon. So I make a definite conclusion here. And they do put a confidence interval. Um, uh, med medical research is a bit better at this than psychological research in putting confidence intervals on their claims. So they give us the confidence interval, 0.48 to 1.17, on this odds ratio measure. As I say, one means no effect. But what's the minimal interesting effect? It's a bit hard to say in this case what a minimal interesting effect would be. But we can say something, and this was pointed out by the uh, statistician Sander Greenland, the study they were following up from had an odds ratio of 0.76. That was significant. And that was regarded as a interesting and important effect size, showing that statins reduced this type of cancer. Notice that was included in the confidence in interval. Not only was it included in the confidence interval, it was pretty bang on the estimate this replication study actually got, their estimate was pretty much exactly what you would expect if this previous study's theory was true. This happened to be non-significant in this case. There's more, no more noise, there were fewer subjects involved. So clearly this cannot be evidence against the original study, right? can't be evidence against the original study if their sample effect size is exactly the same as the previous study. The fact that it was non-significant in this case just shows they didn't run enough, it's not just running subjects, they didn't test, observe enough subjects. <coughs> they didn't have enough sensitivity. It's like me with this coin. I got 100% heads. And I said to you, isn't that evidence the coin is fair? Well, not if I had 100 trials. The only reason why it was non-significant is I didn't have enough trials. I had bang on the percentage of heads you would expect if this was an utterly biased coin, because it is. And the non-significance meant nothing. So here's an example in real life, in a recent study, where that, what I hope is, is obvious in the case of the coin, this fallacious reasoning continues. So, so, so one moral of this is, is when you see a non-significant result used as a claim that this is evidence for nothing going on here, look at their actual effect size. How does it compare to the previous study or what it might have been? Look at the confidence interval. Does the confidence interval include interesting effects? If it includes interesting effects, then your data are consistent with interesting effects. Maybe they're consistent with no effect, but they're consistent with interesting effects as well. So, this way of looking at things can be very useful, in, in other words, the confidence interval. But I don't regard it as a general solution because in almost every study I run, I don't know how to get a good reason for saying what the minimal interesting effect size is. I might get a confidence interval that says a range of effects are possible, I don't know what to do with that. How can I conclude from that in general that there's nothing interesting going on here. Extremely difficult. I've thought about it hundreds of cases. Extremely difficult. So now I'm going to turn to the Bayesian solution. The Bayesian solution wants to be explicit about the fact that there are two hypotheses or models going on. There's one hypothesis, I call hypothesis 0 H0, meaning which, which we typically uh, take to be the claim, the hypothesis, there is no effect. And then we have a hypothesis that there is an effect. Now, what we do in the Bayesian case is to say, 
Um, well, we can start in this way. We can say the strength of belief we have in, in any claim um, should obey the axioms of probability. In other words, we should be able to, in an ideal world, take our strength of beliefs, beliefs as being something like probabilities. How probable is it that it will rain tomorrow? How probable is this or that? Um, if, our, if our strength of beliefs behaved in an entirely rational way, they would behave like probabilities. Now, you can then rearrange the axioms of probability to see how much you should change your belief in one hypothesis versus another, given some data. And I'll take evidence for one hypothesis versus another to be how much you should rationally change your confidence in one hypothesis versus another. Sorry, this... Um, I said... I said A here. That should be hypothesis 1 over 2. And that should be hypothesis 1 over 2. So if you have a prior confidence in hypothesis 1 over 2, whatever it is, and that's sort of subjective and up to you, then you should change that confidence by this amount. And then you'll get your posterior, or the confidence you should have after you've seen the data. Now what this is saying, probability of data given hypothesis 1, is another way of saying that is the evidence, the strength of evidence, is how well the data were predicted by hypothesis 1 relative to how well they were predicted by H0. The more, the better the hypothesis predicts those data, the more precisely it predicts those data, the more evidence there is for that hypothesis. This way of thinking about it uh, was developed by Harold Jeffries, a uh, Cambridge geologist uh, and astrophysicist. Uh, and also a statistician in the 30s. And his first textbook on this um, came out in the 30s. The math was a bit tricky to spell out um, without computers, whereas Fisher's maths was fairly easy to do without computers. So Fisher won the day. Now we have computers that do anything, that's why Bayes is coming back. And incidentally, the same ideas were spelt out by Alan Turing, and he used it to crack... Uh, the German uh, code. And it's thanks to Turin using Bayes and this, this for formula here. Uh, it's partly thanks to him uh, that we thwarted the, the German war effort and in the end won, won the war. We didn't know Turin was doing this until some time later because it, it was classified. But he was basically using this logic. They both came from Cambridge, so the, this might not have been independent. So what we do is uh, we, we work out this thing. We work out how probable are the data given H1 and how probable are the data given H0. Uh, and this bit here in the middle is called the Bayes factor. And by con a convention suggested by Harold Jeffries, if the Bayes factor is greater than 3, then there's substantial evidence for an effect, and in particular the, the way we spelled it out in H1, and by symmetry, if the base factor is less than a third, there's substantial evidence for no effect relative to your model of H1. So now we can make a three-way distinction, you see. If the base factor is greater than three, or whatever cutoff we want to use, th three has a certain um, usefulness given the prevalence of 5% as a significance value, because if P is less than 0 0.05 and the effect size is about that you expect, the base factor will be about 3 or so. So there's a sort of a correspondence. There is, in fact, no necessary correspondence between base factors and p-values. There's no necessary relationship. But if you do get an effect which is about the size you expect, P less than 0 0.05 goes with the base factor about 3. But then by symmetry, if you have a base factor less than a third, and this is what we couldn't do with uh, significance testing, we have evidence for no effect. 
relative to our model of H1. And if we have a base factor around 1, then we say, well, there's no evidence either way. Don't draw. You've got no evidence either way, so if you couldn't draw conclusions beforehand, you can't draw any conclusions now. Don't use your non-significant result to say there was no effect. So we can make more distinctions now than we could have done before, and we can make really important inferential distinctions, namely between whether we, we have good enough evidence for no effect relative to the sort of effect size we thought we could get, or no evidence. But what we have to do is to say, what does my theory predict? Because what we have to say is what's, how, how well predicted are the data from my theory, from my hypothesis. That's the thing. In order to gain this extra information, we have to give something. And what we have to give is to say what my theory predicts. But if you couldn't say what your theory predicted, then how can you get any evidence for your theory? So what, in effect, that means, very roughly, is we need to say what a range of predicted values is. Theories in psychology never say it must be precisely this value. They sort of say a range. The effect size could be as small as this or as big as that. And the question is, how can we get that range? So I just want to give you some ideas about how we could, some simple ideas about how we could do that. So I looked up um, studies looking into the use of green-lipped muscle um, in dogs to cure their arthritis, their sort of their, their knee pains. Um, many years ago, I had a Labrador who got some arthritis, as they, as they tend to, and the vet said, give her green-lipped muscle. So we did. Um, thinking my joints might be somewhat similar to a dog, so I've been taking green lip muscle as well. And um, I think it does something, but whatever I think, anecdotally, what we need is some evidence, right? So this study gave dogs in a capsule some green lip muscle or a placebo capsule that um, uh, didn't have the green lip muscle in. Uh, this was done over 56 weeks. And the vet um, looked at the, the, uh, the use of the joint, how much pain the dog was in, uh, how much they uh, would put their weight on it, uh, how much it limped and so on, and, and rated, rated um, the dog on a 25-point scale. Where five meant normal, that's the bottom of the scale, and 25 is unable to walk. Now, what I've done here is just looked at the trial halfway through at 28 weeks. Now, as it happens, 28 weeks, there's a difference of 0.4 units, which was non-significant. Um, now, can we get a minimal interesting effect size from this? Then we could apply the, the, the previous procedure I talked about. Let's just say um, we think it's kind of difficult to, to come up with a motivated, in other words, minimal effect size, we have good reasons for saying what it is. So let me just pass over that. Maybe you can solve this in some way. Um, but let me move on to how we can think about it in a Bayesian way where we don't have to make that decision. Here's something I call the room to move heuristic. If the treatment works, it can only be better by this amount. That's, that's how much suffering the placebo dogs are in. So if the green lip muscle does any good, um, it can only reduce the suffering by the amount defined by the placebo group. Right? So sometimes just by looking at aspects of the study, we can work out ranges of plausible effect sizes that would be predicted by our theory. And then if I uh, calculate a base factor based on that simple fact, which is, if you would like, an objective fact. Remember in the case of um, the beer and wine, I said, well, maybe I think one is small enough for me. I made a personal subjective judgment. What's a minimal interesting effect size can sometimes seem a bit subjective. But this here, this room to move, is not subjective. It's just sort of given approximately by the, by the study and the data itself. So I can use that to calculate a base factor. I don't know if you remember what 0.43 would mean. So by these conventions, if it's in between a third and three, there's no evidence to speak of. So a third is 0.33. So this is reasonably close to one. 
this isn't much evidence either way. So there's no grounds for saying um, the treatment is ineffective. Now, in fact, I took this midway point because I wanted something clearly non-significant. When it came to the full 56 weeks, they got P equals 0 0.056, which they put as suggestive evidence. And indeed, if we did the base fact on that, even though it's technically non-significant, that would certainly favour there being in it. There'll be more evidence for there being an effect, it would be about round three, than evidence for no effect. So you see how we could actually extract something from this case in a fairly simple way. I'll take one last example. <clears throat> so this was a study conducted in the 80s uh, in which men and women, I'm just going to focus on the men, were either shown, well, 80s pornography, because this was the 80s, or a bunch of Pollocks, Jackson Pollocks to be precise, an abstract uh, artist. And then they're asked, how much do you love your partner? Now, the claim was, and they get a significant result, um, when, men say, uh, when men saw abstract art, they loved the partner to a certain extent, but after what, looking at this porn, they loved the partner to a smaller degree, 0.9 units on a 1 to 9 scale. Seems a fair amount not to love your partner anymore after <laughs> looking at some images of semi-clad women. So it seemed a sufficiently interesting study that it was uh, replicated fairly recently, 2017. And they used exactly the same materials as the previous study. So here I'm just looking at, they had three studies, I'm just looking at study three, just to make a point. In all three studies they got non-significant results, and here's study three with a, uh, a non-significant result. This is just the man again. But non-significant doesn't mean it was evidence against... Um, the hypothesis against the theory. Just, just keep that in mind, because whatever you take from this lecture, non-significant means that even according to the founder of significance testing, Ronald Fisher, suspend judgment. Now, in this case, we can, we can do something very simple, because there's a previous study we're replicating. So we can take as the sort of the, the claim of that study, as it were, is if you follow these procedures, you get an effect of about this amount. So we know what sort of effect we should get, um, the range of differences that are consistent with the first study is from 0 to 1.8. So we can use that for our base factor. And then we get a base factor of 0.57. Now, do you remember what that means? That's above a third and less than three. So it's close enough to one to say this isn't actually in itself evidence for no effect. So if all that was there was study three, we couldn't say you have, you have good evidence for no effect. But we didn't know that just from knowing it was non-significant. We had to do the base factor. And the base factor in this case is terribly simple to do because the previous study gives us the, the sort of effect sizes that we expect. We can just derive that from the previous study. Now. Uh, then what I do, just to show you, we can get different conclusions, I, I looked at the average of the three studies. Now the base factor is 0 0.08. Now that is a good deal less than a third. So that is good evidence for no effect. Okay. So if you have enough data, you can draw, and it's, it's not ridiculously large amounts of data, as we see in this case, there's real amounts of data. Um, you can get evidence, good enough evidence for being no effect, relative to the sort of effect size that may be given to you, for example, in this case, the previous study. So, in fact, I draw the conclusion that looking at 80s style porn um, is entirely harmless in terms of the love you feel for your partner, which is nice to know. So the moral from this is uh, that I want you to take home is to ignore the ubiquitous claims of no effect and no interaction with gender and no interaction with this and there was no correlation and there was no difference between these groups and people were at chance. All of these ubiqu ubiquitous claims that are based on non-significance 
unless one of two things. They've, they've addressed that with a specific technique. In, in other words, they've given the range of plausible effects a confidence interval or a Bayesian equivalent credibility interval. And you see it lies lower than a min minimal interesting value, which they've argued for and given a good reason for why that's the minimal interesting value. They haven't just plucked it out of the air and, so, and said, oh, people think this is small, so... No, I mean, a good reason for why that particular effect in the context of this study is minimal interest in value. Or a base factor has been calculated. So I, I personally now have a policy of a B for every P. Or a B, I mean a base factor. And I draw all my conclusions with respect to base factors. And while I'm rare in that respect, I'm not sure if you've come across base factors, but as you read more of the original literature coming out in, in the last few years and increasingly from now on, you will see more and more base factors. And unfortunately, just as people didn't do significance testing, uh, 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 quite as the originators of it spelled out how it should be done, people aren't quite using base factors quite as they should be used either because they're just learning how to do them. So if you're going to get engaged with research, this will be a good topic to learn so you do know how to use them properly and draw genuine conclusions about whether there is an effect there or not. So I have now introduced you to the four topics that comprise the first half of this module. Karl Popper, um, what do we do? Flourishing, Buddhism and Stoicism, mind-body problem, and uh, base factors. So uh, your job now is to think about those topics. You can look at the essay titles, um, which are on the um, Canvas website for, the, for this module, and decide what you think you might be doing for your, for your essay, and then come to the workshop. So you don't need to come to more than one workshop. You can if you want, if you're undecided between some things. But each workshop has homework for you to do. In order to make the workshop truly valuable, it won't be me talking so much, um, but us discussing how, given how you've thought about things, um, could be a good approach to writing your essay. And I'll be talking about approaches to writing each of these essays. So now look on the website for the, for the workshops and look at the homework that you are meant to do for each workshop and make sure you do it before you come to the workshop. So come to as many workshops as you please, but just make sure before you come, you do the, you do the homework for that workshop, because otherwise I'll say, now sit down and talk with the person next to you, and I'll come and join you guys, uh, and you'll have nothing to talk about. Okay. So you have now one week where we don't have anything, and then we'll have the week of workshops, and then you'll have some weeks in which to write your essay and submit it. All right, thanks very much, everyone.